Hi, Shanna Rowe Jackson here from Caution R Set Play, and today we are going to talk all about composition. In terms of art, composition refers to the way you arrange different elements and different objects in your art piece to create a cohesive whole. Ideally, a good composition will have balance and it will keep the eye circulating throughout the whole composition for a nice, cohesive, pleasing, aesthetic artwork. Now, there obviously are some exceptions to that rule. You may want to have something be on balance purposely so that you can create a specific message through your artwork. But generally speaking, when we speak of composition and a good composition, it is something that is pleasing to the eye and it is easy for the viewer to take in and to take in all the elements. So buckle up because this may be a long one. This is a very, very broad subject. So there's no way that I can fit all the information in. That being said, I'm hoping that this will work as sort of an overview for different design elements and different compositional tricks that you can do in your own artwork. And yeah, so I'm just going to basically talk about some of my favorite things and the things I pay attention to when I'm trying to set up a composition, either for reference photos or for my drawings. I learned a lot of this stuff over the years. I've taken a 2D design class when I was in college and I've read a lot of books. And so this is kind of a combination of all those things, but I will link some very good informative articles in the description below so you can do more research. I went through and looked up a few things that I thought were in line with what I'm going to talk about today so that I could link them for you below. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to start very broad and then I'm going to kind of pare it down and end off with talking about like what you're going to put in your composition. So I'm going to talk about like the broad scope of composition and then start to get into design elements towards the end of the video. And if you need to pause to take notes, feel free to do so. Here we go. So the first set of examples I have here is talking about composition itself. So when you are getting ready to do a piece, one of the first things you're going to want to decide is if you're going to, going to do it in a vertical format or horizontal format. And so these are known as portrait and landscape in the art world. And portrait is because a lot of times this creates focus on like a singular subject. It's often like kind of zeroing in on a subject. Now, a lot of people obviously use it for portrait. As you can see, I use this format here for the portrait I did of my husband in colored pencil. And it really just kind of narrows in on one subject. But obviously, in this example, you can see I used it in a landscape setting as well. So you can use it to kind of zero in on certain landscapes and elements as well. And then, of course, we have the landscape format. And this is the horizontal format. It gives you more of an expansive view. It's less tight. It gives more space. It's more airy. And it really like shows you like a spatial view. It's more scenic. And there are variations of these formats. And so you have your an oval shape, for instance, which could be used it could be used either way, but usually I use it in a more vertical view. And an oval is like a variation of our typical rectangular view. It can kind of add a little bit of a nostalgic feel to it. And it it's kind of serves the same way as a portrait view does, where it's kind of narrowing in on a specific subject. I have used the oval quite a bit with landscapes and I will kind of pop up an image here so you can see one of my favorite landscapes that I did using an oval view and to me it feels very nostalgic I think it's because I grew up in the 90s and like this oval shape was very popular 70s 80s 90s and so for me it kind of gives a nostalgic view and then also if you really want to have a lot of space another variation that you can use is a panorama which is where you're going to be like your length is going to be like two to three times as long as your height. You can use it the other way as well if you want to have a lot of emphasis in the top part of the canvas. But generally speaking, I usually use panorama in a horizontal view. And of course, here you can see a panoramic image that I did of it's an acrylic painting. And you can just see how much space it really gives a landscape. 
And so these are the two most basic shapes. And then these are some variations of that. Of course, you can also do a square shape and the circle would be kind of the variation of the square shape. That sounds a little weird, but it's because they're both perfectly symmetrical. And so all sides are the same side as each other. And since it's a symmetrical shape, it encourages the eye to bounce around the composition and it almost just circulates through in a nice circular shape. And obviously the circle works very similarly. And this kind of narrows the focal point a bit as well. And when you are working with any type of special shaped canvas you really want to consider what that shape might mean for the composition and when you think circle think of like a magnifying glass or it could be similar to like a portal or a porthole nice round like you know like looking through a telescope kind of thing and so it kind of gives that same feeling and I'll show you I tried to use that kind of feeling here in this landscape painting I did from Acadia where it was just like kind of like I was up on the top of a mountain looking through some sort of looking glass kind of thing. And so try to consider what this shape might mean for the meaning of your composition as well. Obviously, these are very basic shapes, but when you're starting to get into the really neat different shaped elements, just kind of think about what it means in relation to what you're actually painting. Something else that I wanted to mention while I have this one up, because I think that this compositional element looks fun on a square or on a circle, is framing the image. And what I mean by framing the image isn't necessarily the frame after, but it has to do with using elements that are in it to kind of frame your focal point. And so you can take related elements and draw the viewer in by putting it around the frame. Here's an example. This isn't a square composition, but the leaves kind of help frame the cardinal in this and draws the eye to it. And it just kind of creates a nice dynamic composition. And while I'm on the, the subject of framing, let's talk about some actual framing. When you are creating your composition, keep in mind that it will most likely be framed after. I like to keep like half an inch where I'm not worried about like if this gets cut off it's not a big deal so nothing that you really really want to be a main focal point should be that close to the edge because the frame can cut it off and the same goes for your signature when you are working sign somewhere within the composition that a frame or a matting is not going to block it so anything important should not be within a half inch it's usually around an eighth of an inch but I go like a half inch around now obviously still carry your composition all the way over but like just make sure that it's something like oh if that leaf gets cut off when it's framed it's not going to be a big deal and that's kind of just a side note that I wanted to throw in there so now you've decided what kind of canvas you're going to work on what kind of shape you're working with and you want to start thinking about balance because balance is the main core of composition. So you don't want your composition to feel heavy in one area and not others. You want them to balance out kind of like a scale. So here are four of the main ways to balance your composition. You have symmetrical balance, which is where the composition is even and pretty much exact on both sides. Think of a mirror image. Um, this isn't going to be as adventurous. It's going to be a little less interesting. It's maybe even a little bit on the stagnant side sometimes, but especially if you're thinking in realism, usually things are not perfectly symmetrical in realism. The world is just not that perfect. And so, if you're somebody who does realism like I do, this may not be your favorite kind of composition. However, asymmetrical balance is where you can have larger objects that might be offset with like a cluster of several small objects. It's more organic, more natural, and a little bit more realistic if you're thinking of terms of nature and even like the human form like when you look at a person's face most people don't have a perfectly symmetrical face and so it's going to be a little bit more natural looking if it's a bit asymmetrical and like here you see as an example I have the trees here offsetting the mountains here so even though it's not more mountains on this side it's kind of creating balance so you don't have the composition feeling like it's going downhill. 
And then another one is radial balance. And this is where things are coming out from a center point in, or from a central point, not necessarily the center, but a central point. So you're thinking of things like in nature, roses, uh, water ripples, things like that. But if you're thinking in elements of design, you could do something like a mandala, you know, that kind of composition. And, you know, here's an example of like a rose piece that I did here that's kind of similar to that. And then there's the crystallographic or mosaic balance. I'm not sure if I said that word right, so don't come at me. And this is where you're pretty much filling your composition with these multiple objects. And they don't all have to be the same size, but when they're put together, it creates a balance. And I use this composition a lot when I am doing my fruit paintings or when I am doing a lot of like very close up looks and views of things. And so this one is a lot of fun as well. So I just want to show you a couple of, of examples um, of artwork that I've done in the past. These are from my 2D design class. And so this was one where I had to take an organic object and break it down, abstract it, and then also make a symmetrical drawing. And so this is a leaf. And so my design was supposed to be symmetrical. Now, I am not a straight line kind of girl. So this is not my strong suit. However, basically it's supposed to be mirror imaged. And that was the, the purpose of doing this project. And then for our asymmetrical project, he also wanted us to do something similar using, you know, the same kind of element. So I chose a leaf again. And here, if you focus just on the main leaf, if I can zoom in, basically I balanced it out with different design elements. And so it has balance within it. However, it's not exactly symmetrical because we have these different design elements on either side. And so that was, these were some pretty fun projects to learn, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Okay, so now that we've been talking about balance and things like that, let's talk about some quick and easy ways to set up a composition that really encourage balance right from the get-go. So two of my favorite ways of doing composition are the rule of thirds and the triangle. So let's talk about the rule of thirds first. Now, these are both derivative from mathematical rules, basically. So this is like a simplified version from the golden ratio. The triangle is a simplified version of the golden triangle. I am not a math girl, just like I'm not a straight line kind of girl. I'm not a math girl. So I am not the girl to explain the golden ratio to you. I've never fully wrapped my mind around it, but I have found the simplified way that works for me that comes out with a pretty good composition. And so that's what I'm going to show you because this is what I'm experienced with. I will, like I said, leave links below so you can learn more about the golden ratio if you are a numbers person and you and you like ratios and things like that. And, and the same with the golden triangle. I'll leave some links below. But these are the simplified versions and this is how I learned and it made it so much easier for me. This is my most used compositional element. And now I do want to preface this by saying I'll be talking about a lot of quote unquote rules and things like that. There really are no rules in art. Create however it makes you feel comfortable. However, you may find that some of the compositions you've done in the past, you're using these elements without even knowing it. And this might make sense to you as to why you actually like that particular composition that you did. That's what I found when I started learning about these things is that I was already using a lot of these things just naturally because I had an eye for it, but I didn't realize that I was using them. And so, but this definitely helps a lot. So the rule of thirds is basically you take your canvas and you split it into threes both ways, both vertically and horizontally. And this kind of keeps your focal point from being completely centered. Now, obviously, again, this isn't hard and fast rules. There are some times when you're going to want to center your focal point. But when you center your focal point, usually... I would do that with like a macro shot or something that's not going to have a lot of other elements in it because it creates a sticky point. So 
And what, what I mean by a sticky point is your eye is going to rest on that point and not circulate through the rest of the painting. And you want your eye to circulate through all the painting because why are we painting this whole thing if we don't want our eyes to circulate? You don't want the eye to get stuck too much. So the this indicates that the best places to place focal points, and you can have more than one focal point, you can have a main focal point and then other focal points, is going to be on these lines or off basically off to the sides not in the center and a lot of the people like to put their main focal point on one of these intersections so if you were to do say a portrait a lot of times instead of having the face right here and a lot of people like to start with the eyes first because the eyes are what really draw people in it might be good to have an eye on this focal point here and then have the head here or whatever. And so basically this keeps the focal point or subject from being too centered. It allows for more space for your eyes to move around as I mentioned. And it puts the important elements on the lines to create balance. So here I have my horizon because this is where the water would be. We have a hill that's going up here. I have the main focal point, which is the tree. And then I have my set of mountains basically laying on that other crossbar here. And it kind of balances everything out. And then um, the horizon, this is another point that I'd like to make while I'm on here. The horizon should never be exactly in the middle either for the same reason. So if you are doing a landscape, figure out what your main focus is going to be. Do you want this to be mainly a skyscape or do you want the focus to be where the land is? And so if you want it to be more about the land, you're going to put your horizon line higher and have less sky. If you want it to be more about the sky, you're going to put your horizon line lower and have it have a, a larger sky obviously and so and that also kind of places you in the composition as well because your horizon line is kind of the resting point of the eye if you were thinking about standing there looking out into the distance and you're looking where your eye rests eye level is basically your horizon line and you can create that in your painting you can create where the person's eye is supposed to be and that is like if they were to picture themselves in this landscape then they're going to feel either higher or lower in the composition themselves and so keep those elements in line like in mind when you are doing a landscape however the main takeaway from this is you split it into three equal parts and you try to place important elements either on these lines and especially on those intersections and then the the triangle and this is very simple to do. A lot of people use this when they're doing a portrait, but it's also very, very good when you're setting up your own still life. And basically the premise is this is a nice grounded feeling. You have everything set right where it's supposed to be. It represents stability, being grounded and a nice solid base. And Renaissance artists use this a lot. It's really rooted in perspective and I'm not gonna get too far into perspective today because I think that probably is going to warrant its own video because that's perspective is a lot. But it's kind of rooted in perspective if you think about like one point perspective where everything's coming out from one uh, focal point, it's just all coming out. But Renaissance artists use this a lot and it can be symbolic of spiritual ascension. So like, down here, we're closer to earth. Up here, we're going up into the heavens and into the spirit world, whatever uh, terminology you like to use for that. And this triangle can have the opposite where it's a descension. So if you had some type of composition where it's coming and narrowing down towards the earth, it kind of has the opposite feel. Now, that being said, you don't necessarily have to think that deep into it. You can just use it as a way to balance your composition. If you're somebody who really isn't into symbology and things like that in your artwork. And I do have a couple things here. Um, like this is my... I use the triangle in this. Obviously, it just kind of balanced the composition very well. And so you may notice that both of these 
really deals with threes and deals with odd numbers, right? You have your triangle, so you have your three points. And you can also have used more than one triangle. Like you can have other things going on in these triangles as well. It doesn't have to just be one set of things in this triangle. Like I use like a lot of the triangle shape here. If you look, I have three main kind of triangular shapes where I have all this stuff going on in this colored pencil drawing. And so it really kind of splits. When you have one tri main triangle, it's kind of splitting your composition up into other triangles as well. And that kind of starts going more into the golden triangle. And again, I'm not going to get into those details because I'm just not the one to explain it properly. But what I was getting at is you have your rule of thirds here. Three is an odd number. This, you know, three is an odd number. And that takes me into the point of the rule of odds. Now, this is because this came about, this is a great way to balance your composition. And this comes about because the human brain likes to pair things up. It automatically does that. And it creates, again, a sticky place. You want your eye to, or the viewer's eye, to circulate through. But if you have two pairs, it kind of, your eye might get stuck on one of the pairs. And so... Like I said, the human brain likes to pair things up and compositions that can create the eye to get stuck. You don't want sticky points. So in order to encourage the viewer's eye to move freely in a composition, you put an odd amount of objects to break things up. Unless, of course, your focal point happens to be something that is a pair. So like if you have a pair of lovebirds, then obviously that's fine. But if you are doing a landscape and it happens to have birds off in the sky, you don't want the eye to get stuck in the sky. So you're going to put like an odd amount of birds so it doesn't create sticky points in the sky. Something else I wanted to mention before I get too far off of the compositions that I was just talking about. In reference to taking photos, most, let me see if I can, I don't know if this is going to show. Let me do it like low to here. Most cameras actually are set up so you can have a grid and it is set up in the rule of thirds. So when you're taking your own reference photos, whether you have a DSLR or something like that, even a phone, this is my old phone. This is the Samsung S uh, Galaxy S7. So this is the old phone. Even these usually have an option to put grid lines on. So see here, it says grid lines. It gives me the option to three by three. And then I turn that on. And I don't know if you can see the lines. See those lines? That is the rule of thirds. It's automatically set up for the rule of thirds. So when you're taking a photo, you can actually set it up with these grid lines so you can take a picture with your emphasis point on one of these points. So that's really, really helpful for when you want to take your own reference photos. And again, that's one of my favorite compositions. I don't necessarily even use the grid lines on my phone anymore to take photos or anything like that because I... I already, like, I'm so used to doing that composition that I'm able to see it naturally. And then one more example using this image, talking about the rule of odds that I just spoke about. I did that here as well. I did multiple elements of balancing this composition. And so I have three apples, three acorns, three pieces of corn, and then I use color to help balance out in a triangular form. And I had my triangles here. So usually you're gonna be using more than one of these elements that I'm speaking about in a piece. And this is an example of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about other parts of balancing the composition and things to keep in mind when you are placing these objects other than just the rules of you know, odds and things like that. So we're going to talk about repetition, pattern, and rhythm. Now, repetition helps balance the composition because it feels active, yet creates a sense of unity. So if you think like you've got these repeating trees, for instance, this is one of my acrylic paintings where I used a lot of repetition. It's a very simple landscape, very simple composition. It is in a panoramic form but 
you can see. And then I'm also using elements to balance each other out. It's like asymmetrical balance because these aren't perfect. They aren't perfectly alike. However, I have these trees balancing each other out so one side doesn't get too heavy. But repetition is the main element here to create unity in this piece in particular. And pattern and rhythm also deal with repetition. It, pattern creates unity by repeating an object or set of objects in the same design each time. And then rhythm is one or more objects that may be repeated to create a feeling of organized movement. Now this is a little bit harder for most new artists to, to grasp. But variety is kind of key here to keep things moving and think about things dancing on the page. And I find that this is easier to see in something that is more illustrative than something that is realistic. But you will have rhythm in realism as well. But just to bring this back as an example here, the different way that I'm moving the leaves creates some rhythm along with the design elements on the outside and just how I did the curly cues. And of course, this all uses pattern and repetition as well. So this is another example here of varying it, having variety to create that flow on the page. Now that we've talked about all that, let's talk about the things that we are putting into it. And that's gonna be the elements of design. So there are six main elements of design. However, there are a couple others I'd like to talk about as well. And there are even more than just the eight that I have here, but these are the basics. Now, the first element of design that most of us are going to deal with, even from when we're a young child, is line. You have your vertical lines, your horizontal lines, your diagonal lines, your curved lines, your zigzags, broken lines, et cetera, et cetera. Now your vertical lines, are usually going to indicate something that is stable and strong. Your horizontal lines are going to give more of a calming effect. Diagonal lines usually create some feeling of movement or instability. If you were to have a building, for instance, that was leaning, then that would create instability because you'd have those diagonal lines to represent that. Curved lines are more organic. I'm sorry if you can hear my dog snoring in the background. He's dreaming. <laughs> but you have your curved lines that are more organic and also indicate movement. And then you have things like zigzags and broken lines. And this usually is some sort of action, instability, surprise, loud noises, things like that. Now, lines aren't just the marks that you make, but they can also be leading lines you have to consider line weight when you're doing any sort of illustration. And line weight is how thin or thick a line is, and that can create emphasis. And then you have soft and hard edges in realism. So in realism, you're thinking more along the lines of edges and not necessarily lines. Because if you have outlines in realism, it can start to feel cartoony and not give you the realistic look that you're really looking for. So I want to take you back for a moment to my original illustration here. We have a lot of line elements in here. We have flowing clouds, which are kind of like zigzaggy. They're a little bit jagged and they're thinner than here. This is our foreground. So this has the darker, thicker lines because we want our attention here, right? And then as it goes off into the distance, I use the line to show more distance. The further away it got, the thinner the lines are getting. And so emphasis is in the foreground here. And then on top of it, I used a lot of leading lines. All these lines are kind of pointing to this main tree. This tree is our pretty much our subject point. So we've got the little path here that's going towards there. We've got this one going towards here. And even the horizon line is pointing towards it. And we have the clouds to balance that out a little bit. So this is a great example of the use of line weight to create emphasis. In an action pose, if you're doing a human figure, you may want to emphasize, you know, have darker, thicker, you picture like a fist coming towards the viewer. That might want to have the darker, thicker lines, whereas the rest of the figure that's in the background may have lighter lines. So if you're an illustrator, that's something to keep in mind. As far as realism goes, we're thinking in terms of hard and soft edges. So I have the pumpkin is obviously the focal point. It is in the foreground. 
I have like these hard edges here because I want this to be emphasized as a nice solid object against a soft background. Whereas in the grass, you have a lot more soft edges. Some of them are not even discernible. They're just kind of blurred right out into the background. And so that's an example of using hard and soft edges and really lines which are actually just become edges. It's all shading in this to create that look. But lines are very, still very important here, even if they're not visible outlines. So that's kind of an overview of line because that's going to be your basic that you're using. Now we have space. You have your positive space, which is your subject, and your negative space, which is, you know, the spaces in between your subjects if you have more than one and the spaces around your subject so again my pumpkin this is positive space this is negative space and you want to look at negative space when you're drawing or even when you are photographing things it is nice to have very interesting negative space when you have dynamic negative space, it helps complement your positive space. And so you consider these elements when you are creating a composition. How does the negative space interact with the positive space? And it's also a great way to draw. If you are drawing something really detailed, sometimes it helps to draw the negative space first because it takes your eye and your mind away from the subject itself. So you're not really worried about drawing the object itself. You're just drawing abstract shapes. And again, I did a lot of that here. A lot of these spaces in between the leaves, these are little negative spaces. I could look at that shape as a geometric shape and draw that first and then draw the detail inside and creating all these negative shapes will create the positive shapes in the long run. And we'll talk about shapes in just a minute. Color, obviously, is also an element. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of color theory here, but basically, color is the hue of the objects that you are creating in your composition. You have a color wheel, and then there's different ways that you can balance your your composition by using different colors. So here, one example that I used was I used two different colors um, opposite each other on the color wheel, which would be purple and yellow. And it, see how they make each other pop when they're next to each other? And then if you actually mix them together, it creates a brown or a gray. And again, I used a lot of those colors in this composition, and it makes them it makes everything pop around each other and it just brings everything out beautifully. But this would be a whole different video. So I'm not going to get deep into color theory here because again, this is already a long enough video. Now we have shape and I had talked again about positive space and negative space, positive shapes and negative shapes. The shape obviously is the basis for your objects and all your geometric shapes can be used to create realism. You know, I have my circles here and the circle here, but there's also some triangle shapes. And so obviously you can use that as a way to draw your objects and kind of break things down and start off with your basic geometric shapes and then pare things down into more detailed objects when you're drawing. Now, value deals with how dark or light something is. If you're working in realism, value is very, very important. You should ideally have the whole spectrum from white to black in your composition just to give things more of a pop. And the whites really should be left for the lightest highlights of something because most things in nature are not perfectly white. But as you can see here, again, it's almost like sculpting on the paper. And so you want to use your values to create that look. And even if you are not working in realism, obviously you can create contrast really easily by using your darkest dark, your lighter light, and, and just to make things pop. So contrast is definitely a key part of value and that's what kind of makes things pop. Now we have texture. Texture can be visual or physical with paint. So when you're creating texture, again, I created texture in both of these 
you've got the grass texture in the background, you're drawing texture in. This is visual texture. I am making, I am implying that these are smooth. I am implying that you can feel this grass. Whereas when you're working with paint and stuff, if you're somebody who likes to do impasto, which is like loading the paint on there, very, very thick paint, you can actually use texture physically to create certain effects as well. And then the other two, which some people like to add, and again, there's more, but we're already kind of getting into a half hour here, if not longer. You have form and text. And form basically combines shape and value. And again, when you're using value, you are creating form. This shading is all value. So I, this is my shape, and I'm shading it to create it to make it look like a three-dimensional form. And then text can create emphasis in your compositions as well. I know, you know, obviously this is great with graphic design and things like that. Okay, so that is my main thing about composition. That's what I got. <laughs> that was a lot. And I hope that it helped you learn some things. Again, I know that there's probably some things I didn't cover here, but I hope that this overview was helpful for you. And yeah, so I look forward to hearing from you in the comments. I will see you next week. You have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching. Bye. If you found value in this video, please feel free to hit the like button, hit subscribe and share so others can see it as well. Thank you.